Welcome back to the Dare to Dream podcast, where we highlight the lessons, learnings, and life-changing moments that come from having the courage to follow your dreams. My name is Gregory Russell Benedict. My name is Vincent Van Patten. And do we have a banger of an episode for you all today. Greg, why don't you bring us in with the quote? Yes. So we're going to start with a quote today. This is going to be our jumping off point, and we will cover a variety of topics. But this quote will sound familiar to many of you, and it is by Marianne Will- Williamson. It goes, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine, as children do. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It's not just in some of us, it's in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. Yeah, man. That was a revelation that I had with this whole spiritual odyssey that I'm on that I feel like is at the the crux of my back pain and my emotional pain. And back pain has just been, it's been six years of the most clearly manifested emotional pain, but I'm realizing that this has been going on for my entire life. <laughs> Since I was a kid, I've had um, physical, just kind of unexplainable physical ailments and <laughs> maladies, <laughs> headaches and stomach pains and just kind of random stuff. And it all came from repressing emotions and repressing who I am. And, you know, as a kid, obviously, we well, we do have wisdom that we don't understand. We feel things intuitively, but we don't have the knowledge and the understanding of what's truly happening. And it took me, I mean, I'm grateful to be 28 and to be doing this now, but it took me 28 years to to finally crack into this into myself and it's been about a month and a half since I've tried to uh, made the change from treating my back chronic pain as a physical thing and really trying to fix my body until I hit rock bottom and had this great awakening and it made me realize I mean when that when that happened and dude this is the same thing that happened with you hitting rock bottom you know, on Japan four years ago and everything changed and that has to happen. And until it does, we're not, we're not ready. It's a crazy thing. It's like your life has to completely fall apart to be completely reconstructed in the way that it's meant to. And that takes work and effort and a openness and a will to actually do it. But until you just are like, I can't live like this anymore you'll probably be much more defensive against this information that, and really all it is, is that you have to change. It's like, nothing's going to fix you anymore. Nothing's going to make you happy out there. You are the thing that needs to change inside. And it takes breaking to, it's almost like there's this genie in a bottle and it takes the, the bottle shattering for like the genie to, the soul to come out. It's like, we got to reconstruct this, this thing around it, this life around this life force, life around this life force. And I was doing meditation on Saturday and it just hit me so hard. I started crying. I'm like, wow, I'm afraid of my own greatness. And none of them might sound arrogant, but a lot of us are afraid of our own greatness. We are more afraid of our light than our darkness because in our darkness is our light. You know, Jung, Carl Jung called it the shadow. And what I've realized is that I've been looking for my, in my shadow, you know, all the things that I need to change about myself and that I've just been unconsciously holding myself back with. But 
as Jordan Peterson says, if you look into the abyss long enough, like you will find the light. You will see the good. The abyss and looks back I'm, at you. Exactly. As I'm looking in there, I'm like, oh my God. I've had this internal conflict made manifest since college, since graduating college and like most clearly in back pain. But it's been this conflict of like dimming my light and being kind of normal versus being like, you're not normal. You have so much inside of you that wants to shine. And unconsciously, I'm creating pain in my body to hold me back for a distraction. So, because that's what like TMS, mind body syndrome is. And what I've realized that's like what my chronic back pain is. It's the brain creates a distraction through physical pain, real physical pain. So it's not like I'm just imagining it. It creates real pain in the body to distract us from the repressed emotions that live in the reservoir of emotion side of us or the reservoir of on our of of our unconscious and because it's like oh i have this pain i can't you know like i was telling you i'll stop for now <laughs> let you come in let you yeah, process I'll, that i'll i'll jump in here and say that what Vinny and i what Vinny, <laughs> what's your name <laughs> what Vinny and i <laughs> oh man okay quick uh Quick disclaimer, we, we <laughs> spoke for an hour before we started recording because we were just firing and wanted to catch up on so many things. But we're going to bring a lot of it into this discussion, which is on the surface, it's really hard to hear that you're afraid of your greatness. Like, really? Is that even true? Mm -hmm. But it's we're so conditioned to fit in. This is how I see it. We're so conditioned to fit in and be normal and wear a mask and have people like us that we dim our own light. We're afraid to show who it is that we really are, which is our greatness, because we don't want to be labeled as weird or strange or regular. And my kind of experience of this quote and previous meltdown was realizing that all of high school, all of college, I was dimming my light. I was wearing a mask. I was being not my true self, not what other people wanted me to be. I was being what I thought other people thought I should be, which is just mm. this faceless, shallow, empty person. Like there wasn't this depth to bad. me. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> but it was just like, I wasn't, I wasn't, I was a one you degree. You. Yeah. It wasn't me. I wasn't my full self. There's a reason we became best friends. Like when we graduated. Yeah. I really didn't like college. you until then. I, all truth be told. <laughs> Still don't like you. <laughs> Barely. Um, that's that's the thing here is that it's really hard to believe that you can be great and you can do these things that on the surface sound so crazy. Like, who am I to have a podcast to expect people to listen to me? Who am I to think that I can help other people improve their lives? What you were talking about and like these grand visions you're having during these meditations, I can see it so clearly that those things are going to come true. But as you are thinking about them, we've been so conditioned through society and growing up that don't think of yourself in that way and mm -hmm. it, it feels it feels very arrogant and grand mm -hmm. but it's like such a different energy and people can tell like that's what i wanted to say to you when you were sharing all of that is that anyone who's ever met you knows that you're not some arrogant prick who's like i'm <laughs> the best thanks buddy try not to be and what's cool about this is like we if we fully embraced that person who we secretly, not secretly, unconsciously know we could be and want to be, that is our greatness. Like if I took, I'm just gonna put it out there because I think it's an awesome dream and this would make me psyched. I'm like, today in my meditation, I'm like, I have my own show. Where I'm like, I just saw myself like in Greece and I was like following the footsteps of Socrates and kind of just like, like asking, um, philosophers and scholars like what was socrates really like like trying to get into like, what who was this guy <laughs> just like walking around the port of athens just challenging people and just having these intense conversations and he was just a cool guy he was just a dude this book i read i mean the last of the wine was so interesting it made it takes place eighth ancient greece and follows this this main character 
and he's just like a student of Socrates. He's just a normal guy, like in in ancient Greece. Plato is like you know another student of Socrates, and he's just like this gifted kid. You could tell he's like a little different. It's fucking Plato, and he's like going to war, fighting the Spartans, and going to the Olympics, and it's like so cool. But that was the first time I was just like, oh my god, Socrates was just this, just this dude who was like just interesting and like people wanted to be around him just charismatic and plato was just a man who like was more introspective and um just, he would write down everything socrates was saying and now we we've been human beings forever anyways i saw myself just like tracing the footsteps of these these people like combining travel and culture and history and what we were talking about before and what we'll get into in a bit of just like the unrushedness of everything. That is so important to me. Not the instant gratification, not the, you know, 100 TikTok videos that are all minute each, but like a book of depth or like a two, two to five year project, I don't know, on like tracing the footsteps of Socrates. And then just like being in Peru and like being in Machu Picchu and just spending time in these ancient villages and I know deep down, this is like, this is what I want. And it's what I'm made for, for some crazy reason. It's a combination of writing and creating and exploration and history and philosophy and psychology, which I'm realizing I am really fascinated in. And just like what makes humans human. And no one could be that but me. And like, whatever your dream is, it's not even conscious to you yet. Like it's, it's something that develops more and more every day with me. And I've been having this internal conflict since graduating from college, because I've had an inkling of this inside of me. It really hit me when I was in Berlin, like, I think like the year I graduated college or something, and I was just walking down a canal at dusk, and it was just beautiful. And I'm like, good God, I love this so much, like just being in this foreign place, the cold and it felt so different and like writing a story about it. And I'm like, how do I make this my life? And that was the beginning. And since then, I tried different jobs, worked in real estate, restaurants, teaching English in Japan, um, clothing stores. And I've known, yeah, I'm like, this isn't, this isn't what I love. Like, this is not what I want to commit my life to. And it was a means to an end. But then that was fuel for the fire of this internal conflict in me. And then my unconscious mind created physical pain because of that conflict inside of me. And it was a distraction from that emotional conflict of like, you're not living 100% truthfully. And it goes much deeper than that of like childhood stuff of with my brother and, <laughs> and like, there's a lot that that goes into it. But this re revelation of like, I am afraid of truly embracing who I am. And, you know, if you listen to this podcast, if you've read any of my writing, you're like, maybe you're thinking like you're, you express yourself, you seem like you are you, but not, not what I could be fully yet. And it's not like I have to reach a point where it's like, I have to be who I could be. It's like just accepting who I am and like accepting that these things that I want are not by accident, you know, these things, this life that I know is meant for me. It's in me for a reason, this potential. And until, I mean, that is my truth. And I'll explain more about just how I'm bringing it into my life um, with meditation and stuff. But yeah, a couple of quick things. I really resonate with the it's in me for a reason. I have the same feeling about so many strange things like why I love green tea so much, why I feel like I was a old <laughs> Japanese monk in a past life. Like there's just these things that have no explanation, but I'm like so sure that they happened or they're a core part of me and listening to those and not obviously questioning them is fine, but at some point just being like, they're there and it's a part mm -hmm. of me and they're here for a reason. That's the first thing. The second thing is if you are listening to this and you're struggling with these feelings of who am I like to quote 
Marianne Williamson again, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, and fabulous? And thinking that you're playing small is actually helpful because you don't want to come off as arrogant or cocky. If you're struggling with any of this, like congratulations, you are not a sociopath and you won't come off as these things if you talk about it honestly, because we each have this light inside of us. It comes up all over the place with all the clients I work with, with all my friends. It's so much easier to see other people's greatness than it is to see your own. And having people around you in your life, friends, family, significant others who can see that and reflect it back to you and remind you of it when you're not feeling at your best is so important and so helpful for this big journey that you're going to go on. Mm -hmm. For sure. And it takes time. Like what I'm learning now is, I mean, it's been seven years at the minimum. It's been a lifetime of like learning and just to finally have this understanding just a little bit deeper and it takes time and that there's nothing to force, nothing to rush, but like journaling about it um, and noticing, you know, like it's taken me stripping my distractions away and I'm pretty much dedicating myself to this right now, just exploring my life and who I am. And, but like ask yourself, yeah, what aren't the things that, what are the things that are not by accident that are just constant themes in your life? Is it like, what makes you, what makes you happy? It's trite, but like, if the job and the career and just the, the stuff that, you know, we can't hear ourselves think because there's so much noise, there's information overload in our lives. And I'm off of social media right now and it's been so helpful. Take a week, a month off. Like I'm just to be able to like, I mean, I'm still on like YouTube and still find myself in the same dopamine trap. And then I go, I'm like, I'm on medium and I was finding myself comparing yesterday to another writer, <laughs> human and it's okay. But like get rid of distractions for a while. It's not like you have to be a, a monk, but it is, it is helpful to actually begin to like listen to yourself and notice themes in your life and journal about it. And just keep asking yourself as the Austrian poet Rainer Maria Rilke says, love the questions themselves. You know, you don't need to have the answers because perhaps you're not ready yet. Love the questions, love the questions ask for the, you know, ask for guidance, ask for signs. And then I hit rock bottom. When I say that I had four flare ups in one month and it, I felt I was in a level of eight pain for like 90% of the month. And I just, that was it. I was like, I cannot do this anymore. And that was when I fully surrendered and that's what it takes. It takes like, I couldn't be halfway in halfway out anymore of like trying to heal and find my path in life. It's like, you got to do this and you got to do it now because you cannot go on living like this. There's this conflict inside of you. You know what you want, you know what you want to be, but you're repressing it and you're trying to be something else, I guess. And it, a lot of it, like I said, goes back to childhood and like trying to be this, just dimming my, my light in a way of like, just didn't want to create extra problems. My family didn't want to create more noise. Just kind of wanted to blend in and just like observe and kind of just fit this role instead of being like, I want to be the star of the show. I want attention. And a lot of it does come from like a lack of self love and unworthiness. I think that's something that we all deal with like all these things the feeling of not wanting to shine comes from like a, a lack of self-love because we feel like we're not worthy right and it's something that i'm like understanding now like wow there are a lot of ways where i need to work on like self-love and i i don't accept myself as who i am without like all the pressure and the, the extra weight and the guilt and the, the inner critic like loving who you are is accepting your own greatness too. It's like it goes hand in hand because 
I can't get to that place. You know, we can't get to that place. Riding on fumes of self-flagellation and like self-hatred. It's like now I'm working on just loving myself so much that like it, this rest of this bullshit does not matter. I know where I want to go. You're with me or you're against me. I'm not going to bring anybody else down, but like I'm going to do me. I'm going to step into it. And that can only make people better. And if it doesn't, that's okay. You know, we're all doing our best. But it definitely does come from loving ourselves and believing that we are worthy of these audacious dreams or just living a life that makes us happy instead of what is expected of us. And that's where I go back to who you surround yourself with is so important because any person who does some outrageous feat or has a crazy job or gets paid to help other people tailor their gardens, like just these crazy things that people make money from, I'm sure they had that thought somewhere along the way of like, who am I to do this weird, strange, unique thing? And if you can have good people around you supporting you and encouraging you, that's important. But there's also this piece of it is that even the most loving, supportive person might question it and be like, who are you to do that? And you have to be strong enough in your own knowing. That's what I'm working on because I'm so impressionable, so easily influenced by other people's opinions still, as much as I feel like I'm steady in my ways and don't care what people think. I, I care a lot about the people I care about thinking. Sure. And I'm trying to work on being more, like I said, strong, having a fortitude of inner knowing that even if someone I care about says, I don't think you can do this or you should do this or blah, 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 knowing that if it's my path, that that is the right thing to do. And another thing that comes up is as you start to step more into your light, take off the mask, figure out who it is that you really want to be, a, a few things will happen. One is that you will feel so much more alive. That's usually how I judge it. I use it as a gauge. It's like, how alive do I feel right now? For me, my soul is super playful. And I coined this term with my coach, dangerously playful. Like if I'm in that energy where I'm like, I'm feeling dangerous, <laughs> like let's go talk to some strangers. Let's go do something outrageous. Like that is my truest essence. And if I'm worrying about how things are going to play out or if I can do it, if I'm good enough, like that's the kind of the opposite energy. And mm -hmm. so the more you can tap into who you are under the mask, the more alive you will feel. And as you start to make some of these shifts, you might go too far one way and then realize you actually want to bring it back a little bit. And what's coming up for me in this is that when I had my meltdown and I didn't drink for two years, then I was like, okay, I just never drink again. And I kind of like fell into that being, a, being an identity. Mm -hmm. And now like not drinking is cool. And I find myself being like, oh yeah, I'm going to keep not drinking because it's cool. But I had two Coors Lights with my buddies this past weekend while we were crabbing. And like that felt so authentic. And like that felt like me instead of this mold of the non-drinker anymore. Mm. If that makes any sense. Zero. Uh, just kidding. <laughs> yeah, buddy. Makes a lot of sense. It's, and that's what I'm working on right now. It's whatever we hold, just pretty much holding everything lighter or just with such a, with less of a grip, like everything that, I think everything truly good in life, <laughs> big statement, is going to come not from like forcing, not from making like, you have to just fucking drill this thing and like it becomes so intense and ingrained, like, just trying to like flow and everything. And that is like, cause life is change. Even right now, you know, my, my routine is like becoming this, um, my routine is pretty much knowing myself right now. I'm like meditating, journaling, and it's a lot. It's, it's wearing on me a bit. I've been like pretty, um, tired, <laughs> plainly stated. It's been draining and, it's like all day I'm just kind of working on this stuff and thinking about it and having like 
And once you open yourself up to this, it's pretty much like, you know, the, the genie's bottle is shattered and it's just like, I'm very impressionable to the universe. Like the an answers or just signs are just falling like freaking rain. And so I'm just getting hit with this stuff. I'm like, oh my God, Jesus, wow. Like left and right. And it's just, it's a lot to think about at all times and having these crazy moments and just seeing how everything is connecting like stars in a constellation, like the things that I'm watching, the the things that I remember a friend saying like since when I was a little kid, like, like I was telling you before that stuck with me. I'm like, oh my God, this is why that stuck with me for so long. Like this is why it was important. Um, flowing is what I'm trying to get at here. There, This isn't an answer that we're trying to find, as I said, with Rilke. Just loving the questions, loving the questions themselves and being open to them. And once you get to this place, you will begin to flow confidently in your direction and your path. And something that's pretty cool that I've been thinking about is, you know, our path, we see it. A lot of the Dare Dream podcast is like helping, helping you find your path in life. And that could be seen as your job, your career, your passion. Like, what is my path? We see that as like our career path, I would say. I'm realizing my path is inside. My path, my path in life is just going in inward. And I'm realizing that all of the stuff, the writing, the creating, the exploration, why I'm so interested in it is because my path is a spiritual one. Like that is my path in life, is getting to a just understanding myself. And we could all have that. Like we are all on that, but maybe you're less open to it. And I think it's helpful to see, like, you don't need to, this doesn't mean you have to find, you know, I have, I have no idea what my next job is going to be in Japan. Like I was telling you before this, I really have no idea what I'm going to be doing after Japan. If I'm going to be, be here for three years, everything is quite up in the air right now, but in a certain sense, you know, it's, it feels like I'm just at the bow of a ship and it's just like endless paths before me. Like I could go in any direction and that's kind of overwhelming because it's like, wow, what is my path? Then also just realizing that any way I go is still on my path because my path is just going inside deeper and deeper. Like even if my next job isn't something that I love and, you know, it's, it's not yet the Netflix show where I'm following Socrates. <laughs> it's like, that is still part of my path. And to flow confidently in whatever direction these winds blow me, I'm still on my path because now, now that I have this understanding, um, I can't unsee it. And something I wanted to bring up, that man is just like, the craziest concept. Are you ready? <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> the universe will take away what you love most just to make you realize how badly you want it, how much you love it, and what it means to you. And my my supernatural aide, Diana, who's been guiding me on this spiritual odyssey, told me, she told me this. And when she told me it, I thought, I'm like, oh, my physical body, like, the universe took away sports, took away the gym, took away everything, just to make me realize how much I love working out, how much I love the gym and everything. But then I'm like, wait, what do I truly love most? And it's this dream. And two months ago, I was really considering changing my path in life. And I was like, this is before the spiritual odyssey, this is before this is where I was still trying to treat my back physically and thinking that I could just like fix myself and that my whole life was going to be dictated by the back extension machine. <laughs> like I was going to have to find one in the mountains of Peru. Um, Carried on your back bit. all the way there. <laughs> <laughs> Cranking out back extensions everywhere I go. No, but I was like, maybe this is just not the path for me. Maybe I cannot travel the world, you know, on a whim and maybe I just... I got to do something different. Like, why am I here? What am I doing? I'm in more pain now. Like, maybe I'm just doing the wrong thing. Boom. 
rock bottom. I just hit it. That was right before. And then things got, things blew up. And then it made me see, you know, then it's been a month and a half until I had this realization of being afraid of my own light, my own destiny, my own greatness. And I was like, oh my God, not only is this the thing I want so badly, I have to do it. This is what I'm on this earth to do. And it's been taken away from me. Just entertaining the notion that maybe this isn't the path for me was devastating and like very hard to wrap my head around. But I'm like, I started entertaining it. And then this just made me realize this is exactly what you're meant to do. You had to go through six years of chronic pain, you know, day in and day out to make you realize how badly you want it. You had to fight for this. I've been fighting for this life. I'm in Japan despite the pain anyway. And I've just been fucking, you know, it didn't, it's not coming easy. And this is by no means the end of the road. This is just the beginning. But if I may, I'm just going to read a, a quote by JP, Jordan Pearson. Mm, come says, on, and I've missed that man. He, I think we need more, more of JP again. Old school JP. I've been watching. His new stuff is he's gone kind of off the deep end. But his old stuff of like, I mean, yeah, eh, not necessarily. He's just he's doing his thing more in the political realm these days. But it used to be like I'm watching again his old lectures on Jung and Freud, just like his psychology lectures. Dude, that is fuck it. It's so good. The stuff mm. he's. I mean, the comments are like, he's talking about Jung and Freud. It's like in 100 years, there's going to be YouTube videos of professors giving lectures on Jordan Peterson. And dude, that is true. Like he is fucking genius. So with that being said, he said, Jung said that if you follow what is meaningful and you do it honestly, it will take you somewhere you really do not want to go. And until you go there, you'll never be able to climb up higher on the other side. So that provides a real impediment for enlightenment because for enlightenment, for enlightenment, there's a price to be paid. If you look at archetypal representations of the cost of enlightenment, you often find that the person who becomes enlightened is damaged in some profound way before it happens. And, you know, enlightenment, mm. I see that as like my spiritual odyssey, getting to the place I want to go, reaching my destiny. But I've been damaged in a profound way and we have to be these are our primal wounds that to reach conscientiousness conscientiousness consciousness full consciousness we have to be wounded in a certain way to wake us up and it could be 40 years of being wounded slowly but surely until you have a midlife crisis and you're 50 years old and you're like what the fuck am i doing with my life i mean rich roll that's what happened to him 42 yep. and changed his entire life and became an authentic version of himself but we need the wounds and we will be wounded and this is you know i very excited i got the the hero's journey uh the hero with a thousand faces joseph campbell i'm gonna read it next because like we've dabbled with the hero's journey over the years but it's never i mean we, we talked about this but i thought i was on the journey this whole time when i was truly just fearing the call. I was denying the call to embark on the true journey, which is what I'm on now. I thought I was already in the belly of the whale, but I was truly denying taking that leap into, you know, the unknown, the true unknown of my own inner abyss. <laughs> but the hero's journey is so fucking true. It's just insane. Yeah. I have so much to say about that. But first, an important update is that I discovered the name for your Netflix show. It's called yes. Scones with Socrates. It's you drinking tea and having a scone and a nice crumpet. Oh, God, that sounds good. I love a good scone. <laughs> yes. Perfect. So I'm so glad you came back to that. You quoted yourself of something I wrote down earlier of the universe took away my dream just to show me how badly I wanted it. And... I feel like this is in line <laughs> with myself. <laughs> I, I feel like this is in line with the hero's journey and becoming who it is that you're meant to become. You shared a quote in your newsletter that was fantastic. I'm going to read it. It's by Anton Chekhov. 
I long to embrace, to include in my own short life, all that is accessible to man. I long to speak, to read, to wield a hammer in a great factory, to keep watch at sea, to plow. I want to be walking along the Nevsky Prospect, or in the open fields, or on the ocean, wherever my imagination ranges. Mm -hmm. I have no idea what the Nevsky Prospect is, but... I think it's yes, in port in Russia. This idea of doing all of these things that are fulfilling in and of themselves, it probably doesn't make sense for me, I'm speaking about myself now, to learn how to wield a hammer or to learn how to build things or to do all of these things that are outside kind of what I do for work, but I want to do those things. And it's this idea of being a Renaissance man or a Renaissance woman that has always fascinated me. I mean, it's why my newsletter was originally called Renaissance. I just changed the name, but it's doing things because you want to learn them. You want to have these experiences. You want to have like the tattoo on your arm. You want to have these experiences that are arrows in the quiver on your back and having them for the sake of having them, not because they will get you to the next step or look good on your resume or your LinkedIn profile. This ties into what we're talking about today is it ties in because as you, as you, take off that mask and do more of what is truly you. You'll have these weird yearnings, hankerings for these things that, again, seem useless or nonsensical on the surface. But that I read that quote and I was just like, yeah, like I want to keep watch at sea. I don't even know what that means, but like I want that to be part of my story. I mean, you're going to do an episode in the lighthouse in the port of Maine. Keep exactly. Watch. And like that's that's something kind of balancing the greatness versus what other people think versus what we truly want is that's something I've grappled with in our lifelong journey to live a story worth telling of thinking, Oh, am I only doing this because it's a story that I can tell other people about, but mm -hmm. I know deep down in my core that it's not and that doing it and writing a story about it is like one of the most fun, fulfilling, exciting activities. And it's that act that's important, not the fact that, people may or may not read it. And mm. what are you, what are your thoughts on this? And why I'm getting so excited about it is because this quote makes me think of you get to design who it is that you want to become down to the smallest quirk and nuance. You can't fit yourself into some trendy mold like you drink or you don't drink or you're super into yoga and all these things. It's like continuing to bring together all of the little nuances that make you, you. It's just so exciting mm. for me. Dude, yes. You have many thoughts. It's exactly like it's it's so easy to put ourselves in this box of like, oh, this is who I am, this is my identity. And this is what I'm this is what I'm breaking and remolding right now because there's a lot of me that you know, I'm seeing now that the kid that I was at eleven years old, the kid who was quiet and chubby and had long goth hair or grudge hair, the girl from the grudge, who I kind of like judge as like, you know, sad. I was like kind of a moper then, I'd mope. Because I was just repressing emotions, <laughs> you know, kind of just grumpy all the time. Wait, you had and long I, you had long hair. Grudge hair? Like the girl from the grudge, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it was like black Side in note. front of my face. I need to see that at some point. The grudge or the picture? Uh the or picture. Both. I've seen the grudge, Side unfortunately. Oof. Yeah, that was it. It was my. Anyways, <laughs> um, I was judging that kid as sad, or I just didn't understand that I was repressing emotions for a reason because I didn't understand what was happening at the time. There's a lot of change and challenge around me, and I was taken it on in the best way that I knew how and that was by just kind of being silent and I didn't want to create more trouble. And I was judging that kid for years and realizing now that he holds the answers. He holds the answers that I'm looking for now of what makes me happy, of who I want to be. So as I'm becoming somebody new and like truly and dude just like yeah bringing all these little aspects of my character together now it's like at the core, I've been the same because I was dimming my light since then. And like that core was there. But we 
we don't realize that we can be whoever we want to be. And, you know, I might take getting off of social media and might take doing, moving to a foreign country that you have no business moving to, but you just want to do it. So you do. And you realize like it was for a reason. And a couple of things on like, I mean, yeah, Santana, my best buds, I had him on the podcast and he'll be on very soon. Um, he, like, I met him in Japan because he just wanted to go to J Japan and study matcha. So we did. And he had no plan what to do. When he got there, he went to a matcha shop and met Kaoru, <laughs> this angelic woman who I'm very close with as well. And she, I like, told him which matcha farm to go look into or she told him to like go to this matcha festival and he went there and met this other person just like so random and it was like his life is just it's a spiritual life and it's all these crazy things happening and this matcha person like told him this farm that he should work on and he spent like two months working on this ancient like at this matcha school just this crazy thing and like he wants to go learn how to ride horses in saudi arabia play the fiddle in France or <laughs> play the fiddle in Ireland, learn the ballet in France. Like he just wants to do this stuff because he wants to. It's like, it's not his job. It's just for pure soul enrichment. And who says that isn't why we're not on this earth. You know, there's these things that, and it might not be able to put that on your resume, but it makes you a badass you went to learn how to ride horses in Saudi Arabia. If you want to do it, Santana says, we have to, we have to do those things. I had to come to Japan. And like we were talking before, I'm having mixed feelings about it these days. It's just an interesting time. But my God, am I glad I came here. I'm just so grateful to be here and to experiencing to be experiencing it and to have this period of my life taking place in Japan and being in Tokyo like I'll never not regret it <laughs> <I'll> ne <laughs> oh boy oh god I'll never regret it I'll never have that regret of like yes. I didn't take the shot I think that's what I was trying to say okay a couple of things come up I'm trying to find a note one of the things though like I love what Santana said. If you are feeling that thing, you have to go do it. And have to. That's actually what Viktor Frankl said as too. What Viktor Frankl said too. You have to listen to what your conscious commands you to do. It's there for a reason. If someone says, hey, like I just heard this, horseback riding in Saudi Arabia, that doesn't sound great to me, to be honest. But <laughs> if that was within me, I would have to go do that. And if someone else tells you, that it's this thing you have to do. It's different than if it just like comes from within. Mm. And one thing you were just saying, let me find it. You can't fear not having the chance to do something if you've already done it. This mm. is in regards to the regret piece. I think so many people, myself included, how peaceful would it be if we just started slowly? You don't have to do them all at once but just start checking off the things that you know you would regret not doing. And that becomes a part of your life because you can't regret the things that you already did if mm. they turn out good. Obviously, if you do something really bad, you can, but I, I let me say that differently. Like going back to the quote, you can't fear not having the chance to do something if you've already done it. And that just can't, speaks to me. So much of our- Go so ahead. much of our wondering and worrying is the what if. What if I did mm. this? What if I did that? And if you just do the thing, you can close the loop and put that to bed. For me, here's a weird example. My dream car all of high school was a Subaru 2013 Subaru WRX hatchback manual. I wanted this. My whole life, I was like, I want this car. I want to drive manual. I want to learn how to just drive stick and know I can do it and have this car. And I bought this car last year, had it for four months and then sold it because I was like, that was a terrible decision because this car is too fast. It's too loud. It doesn't fit my lifestyle.
but I was able to close the door on that car and having a manual car. And it's like so relieving. And it, again, like looking back, it's kind of silly that I did that, but it was so important. It needed to happen. And now I never have to wonder if I want that car. You got it. You got it, baby. And the cool thing is what you will discover from doing the thing is not what you originally went to discover like what what santana found in japan what i found in japan i mean who knows if <laughs> there's so many variables but like i have no clue that i would actually be on this healing journey now if i wasn't in japan for some reason there's just so many things that aligned in specific ways and what you will find by doing the thing if you're like i gotta move to australia like i just part of me just needs to do it you will find something there that you could never have expected and it's not even it doesn't have to be just going to a physical place it's like learning this thing i want to learn the fiddle and it's like by learning the fiddle you will learn something about yourself that you could have never expected and it's like that was made to happen for a reason and our path in life, what I was saying before, that is part of our path. Doing these things that don't feel like they part of our career or our job. Our path is not just our career or our job. Our path is love and loss and seasons and chapters and realizations and setbacks and pain and the books we read and the movies you watch. That is all part of our path. And these things, you know, it's not like, we have to act on every whim we feel, but the things that matter, I think, you know, you know, what matters to you. And like I said, like it might take getting to rock bottom and just having your world crumble for you to realize how bad it matters to you. Because if you dabble, I just don't know if there's room in this life for dabbling. Mm. You know, you got to go all in. And what that means is up for debate. Like what is, like I was kind of saying before, I don't know necessarily. I've said for a while or that I want to be the next Anthony Bourdain. I don't know what the next step to get to that point is. I don't know. <laughs> it's like, all right. And now today to be the next Anthony Bourdain, I'm going to do this. It's like, all right, what does that mean? It just means that I want to live my dream life. And I want to create, and I want to show people the world in my own way. That's pretty much it. And I want to be big, you know, I want to do it on a grand scale, inspire people and change this world in whatever way I can for the better. And the only way I could do that is by doing exactly what I'm doing, <laughs> by believing in it, by believing in my own greatness and my own destiny, and by taking the small steps every day to get there. But once you have that vision, and I'm learning a lot about this through Dr. Joe Dispenza and his books, Becoming Supernatural is awesome. And I read these books. Actually, I never read the books, but I listened to him on podcasts and stuff before years ago. It didn't hit quite as hard. Like it, it's it's pretty supernatural stuff of like truly, you know, creating your own greatness and believing in it and visualizing it and meditating. Like it's, it's deep and I didn't fully give into it, but until I hit rock bottom and was kind of shown this path, now it's like, oh my God, we create everything. We create our destiny, our reality, our bodies, all with our mind and our pain and our thoughts or our brain, not our pain. We all, we create everything. I'm like, we don't need to know that, you know, the rational analytical mind tries to analyze and plan and uh, imagine before it happens, or like expect. We can't expect these things to happen. Think about the greatest stories, you know, these people that we look up to, the greatest stories and literature and everything. It's like you can't foresee the way things are going to go, but by believing yourself, by believing that you are worthy of the things that you want, by believing in that inner longing inside of you for these things that may seem audacious, that is affecting the universe. That is creating 
the the change in your life and you don't necessarily need to go out there and like find the thing it'll come to you once you live a joyful life and are living more aligned with your truth and your your true callings and your own your own light it'll start finding you amen mhm mm yeah but what else has been going on I think the only thing I would add to that is yes to all of that and then take action and mm. take inspired action. Take action that comes out of these meditations, that comes out of what you're thinking, because that's a dangerous combo. You taking action out in the world while creating this force that's drawing things to you. That's what I think, in my, in my opinion, that the law of attraction misses is that you still have to do something. You still have to get mm -hmm. off the couch and get out there and increase your surface area for luck by being yes. in the world. But yes, I agree with all of that. And I think to tie it back to what we've talked about throughout this episode today is that that is how you step more into your true self, the dream life that you can create, that only you can create. And one of the first steps of that is that believing that it is possible, which is super, super hard. Super hard it to is. believe that it's possible in the beginning. For sure. And like I was saying, it comes back to that self-love thing. Like, who am I to who am I to want these things? Who am I to actually entertain the belief that I could get that? And like, how am I gonna do it? Yeah, you don't need to know how, but you do have to take action. And exactly. It's not like it's gonna just appear on your doorstep, but you don't need to know the path. Just know that you are on the path. And start asking for the guidance from the universe, people, like this all comes from a place of being open. And if you embark on this new journey, just be open to whatever happens and see the signs as signs. Like, my, why do I feel so strongly? I got to talk to this person. Why do I feel like I got to do this? You got to match it. You got to match the intent with action. You got to match the universe. The more you put out, like, you know, with writing and with creating, I don't necessarily see the immediate response or like, you know, I rarely see anything, <laughs> but it's for me, it's for creating, it's for, I'm creating potential in the universe by, by making progress, by moving. And this stuff makes me happy in and of itself. Like, and right, work on this book right now, like that is it's just making, it's building this thing inside of me of understanding and of energy. It's like, so yeah, basically be open to the signs from the universe. <laughs> know the thing that, you, that you're that you striving for, make it crazy and just take those little steps, have fun, cherish it. Like right now, I'm really trying to just, now that I know what's possible, now that I know what's coming, now that I know I'm going to be out of pain, like, dude, I cannot, I cannot describe what I'm experiencing, like with having gone through, if I may just, just explain this a little bit, having gone through six years of chronic back pain, it's like where I thought my dreams were off the table, where I thought I was broken for so long. Well, I thought it was just over. Like, I'm like, part of me is just believing, hoping that one day the pain would just go away and still trying to, you know, go for my dream, still trying to get this thing. This hero's journey, it's, it's so true and we are all on it. And I'm finally embracing the unknown, which presents its own challenges, but just to know that my dreams are back on the table. Like I said, to actually entertain the thought that it was over, that would have to change. I was going to be a banker. <laughs> JK would never do that. Maybe I would never know. But to see what I wanted so badly taken away and then to now know that it's only a matter of time. There's no timeline on my healing now, but it doesn't even matter anymore. The back is not even the point anymore. It's like, that's just a part of this greater picture. Cause we all feel pain. My back pain is 
whatever you're dealing with. It's, it's anxiety, it's depression, it's shoulder pain, knee pain. It's like, it's just pain. We all deal with stuff, both inwardly and outwardly. And mine was just quite poignant back pain for six years. And it was deep. And it's going to take a lot of unraveling. But now I'm in this great unraveling. And it's like, I just want to know who I am and what I'm capable of. I just want to live an extraordinary life. And like the back pain going away is just a byproduct of that. It's the less I focus on it, the less I realize that it's just emotion. That's the recipe for healing. And I want to talk about um, did you want to talk about like your, your friends and what you realized with them and just yeah, I'll bring, I'll bring this in and then we'll kind of bring things together we'll and wrap it. things up <laughs> because I'm exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> I wish the time change was easier, but yeah, I'm fine. We got to do what we got to do. Stuff too, so we're on other end of the spectrum. Yes. So good morning. A couple of things came out of this weekend that I spent with two of my best friends in the whole world from high school. I've known one since fourth grade, probably around fourth grade for both of them, just lifelong friends. And there's so much value in spending time with lifelong friends. I flew up to Portland. We spent a day in Portland and then we went to the Oregon coast, Lincoln City, and we went crabbing. And the whole weekend was so different than my life down here in that nothing was rushed. We had like one activity to do per day on Friday, it was play golf. Our tea time was at 1230 middle of the day. So we woke up, made breakfast, drank coffee for like two hours, just hung around, played golf all day. That was it. The next day we drove out to the coast and our only activity was go crabbing. So we get in this little boat and we're out on where the river meets the ocean. And for just three, four hours, we're just dropping the pots, going up and down in our little boat, just checking them, catching crab, throwing a lot of them back because they aren't Drinking big enough Coors to light. eat yet. Drinking Coors Light. I had two beers because it just felt oh. so good. And it's crazy. Yeah. Like what we believe about what we're doing impacts our health and our bodies so much. I felt amazing. I slept well, didn't feel hungover. If I have one beer in a situation where I don't really want to have it, I'll wake up the next morning super hungover and it's all mental. Mm. So, yeah, that's go crazy. ahead. Well, just that's just the brain, our thoughts. It literally it creates a reality and creates yeah. physical symptoms in our body. Like it is, I can't unsee it now. It's crazy. Yeah, it's nuts. Continue. And like that just felt to me that just felt like my truest expression in that moment. Like no one else wanted was telling me I needed to do that. It just like I was like, this just Check feels right. This car's light. It feels right Check for it, the Greg. moment. Your inner voice. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I came back from this trip and I just had this sense of peace, like deep peace. And I felt so nourished and recharged. And I realized that it's because I had so much space. We weren't on our phones. We didn't have cell service when we were at the coast. We had one thing to do and that was it. And just not being rushed because I'm so rushed in my day to day jumping from call to call to call to task to activity to checking the box. And mm. it made me realize as I was flying home on the plane, I always have these thoughts on a plane because I can't really do anything else. I'm just sitting there. Yeah. And like the only thing I would change about my life right now is just a little more time to think a little bit mm. more time to read because I love, it feels like such a guilty pleasure just sitting down with a book and reading during mm. the work day. And I love reading. That was a big realization for me. Just slow down. The work will always be there. The calls will always be there. It's okay to schedule some time to do nothing so that it doesn't get, I say schedule time to do nothing because otherwise it'll get, it'll get a, a meeting Filled. slotted in there. Yeah. But yeah. And I've, I've had this I've had these thoughts before. It usually happens every time I take some sort of trip. And it was awesome. It was a three-day trip, super easy to fit into the schedule. And it just like reset everything. And now I'm just like, okay, slow down. Don't rush. Enjoy all of it. So that's what that's what I'm taking away from that trip. The value in creating more space. Yes. Yeah, dude. That's what I'm realizing with this whole process. 
I mean, right now it's nothing's as important as just being like calm with it and just flowing with it, being easy on ourselves, being just good to ourselves, loving ourselves. And I've said it many times, but off social media right now. And like, it feels so good to not, I still like on the train. I'm like, I jump on my phone. Like, look at my emails. I'm like, there's, you know, there's nothing there. There's nothing on your phone for you. Like just, and it feels good to just like close my eyes and not even listen to music sometimes. And just, just like, just be there, listen to the beeping, of the train and just like practicing, just like breathing. And it's all about just kind of settling the nervous system. And dude, just realizing that it's so important to me as well to just be unrushed and to like go deeper into fewer things and to truly just embrace the slowness of life. Like we, there's this concept that we have to be doing so much and that we have to be just achieving and just fucking grinding. But like, what makes you feel good? And it's becoming so clear to me that depth over immediate gratification is so important to me that like taking time, just cherishing, just, just being like, that is so important to this journey and to this process and just being cool with it. And it's so important, like giving ourselves the space and not feeling guilty for it. Like, which is not easy. Like last night, I just had this kind of stressful day of trying to find a basketball court. You think it'd be less stressful, but it, it was frustrating. Couldn't do it. Couldn't find one of those open. Anyways, got home. I, I was going to post a video on YouTube and post the podcast. Sorry, I did not do that, but I'll do it after this. And then, you know what? You got to just watch something funny. Like have dinner and just watch some comp. Like you just need to like just relax, and laugh. The work will always be there. The posting, whatever the hell you got to do will always be there. But allow yourself time to just be. It's important. Yes. Yes. Well, I'm so excited to watch your journey continue to unfold. I'm excited to see you step more into your light. Stop showing up as such a dark little grudge looking <laughs> thing. Crab. Yeah, man. Thanks, bud. It's going to be great. Thank and you. scones with Socrates. Just know that scones when with Socrates. you are filming this show, I'd love to be there in some capacity. You will be Socrates in a full beard and toga. You'll be the, <laughs> uh, the placeholder. Perfect. Yeah, that'll be our show. Just put it on the record. We're going to have a show where we get paid to eat large amounts of food. That's going to we, happen. We were talking about this before we started recording, like, I struggle with self-doubt on a lot of things. And for some reason, I know deep down that that is absolutely going to happen. It's no doubt. I don't know it. why, but we will get paid to eat and talk about the food and how good oh, it is. God. Uh, not in any, not, not knowing any sort of culinary vocabulary. Just no, being like, zero. This is delicious. <laughs> <laughs> so tasty. <laughs> oh man. Yeah, dude. Me and me and Patrick are going to China in November. Just going to put that on the air. <laughs> China. Yeah, good food there. Go in China. Great. Yeah, that's going to be good. All right, bud. This has been a fun one. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. If you like the show, please leave a review. We could really, really use it. Or just like it, if that's a thing. Leave a review, please. Leave a review. If you're listening to this on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, you can leave a review. If you're on YouTube watching this in all its glory, give it a thumbs up. Subscribe. Like and subscribe, baby. Thank you so much. Like and sub. We love you all. Love y'all. Peace.